Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for that special music. That was lovely. Welcome home from the feast. Welcome to all of our guests, all you wage farers who are joining us today here in Charlotte, only 116 strong. It does seem very different from our normal Sabbath, doesn't it? Over the years, I've noticed something. Though it is true of the re regular Sabbaths, it is especially true of the first Sabbath after the feast. And that is exuberant joy. God's people come home having been spiritually and physically fed, and they want to share all of their joys and pleasures, the experiences they've had wherever they've traveled to with their own home brethren. And so here we are, back again, and this joy at times can be palpable. You can feel it as you walk in the room, even though our numbers are reduced. But afterwards, when we fellowship, no doubt, photos, cameras will be brought out, photos will be shown, and we'll have all these experiences to share because we have feasted and been feasted for eight days by God at his festival sites around the world. And we have had a foretaste of the glorious kingdom of God. My wife and I traveled to San Diego this year. Mr. Sherrod McNary asked if we would go out to give a hand there. And we were joined by two daughters, a son-in-law, and two granddaughters. And it was a joyful time for us to have a bit of a family reunion, at least part of our family. We did so many fun things together. Of course, San Diego is famous for its zoo. It's one of the first things we went to. But my wife and I, first thing we did when we got off the plane, we went to see the USS Midway, the retired Navy vessel, aircraft carrier that's right there in port. Huge military base course in San Diego. We went to the beach, got to swim in the Pacific Ocean, so now I've swum in both Atlantic and Pacific. We went to the Torrey Pines Trail, to a trolley tour, Cabrillo National Monument, which goes back to the days of exploration and colonization of North America. Mr. Roger Bardo and his staff did an exceptional job in serving us all, and here is the brochure. So this is what I can show you from our fee site. My wife and I got home about 6.30 last night. I'm still on West Coast time, although I'm not sure if I ever did adjust to the West Coast time, but uh, I feel like it. I feel like uh, the body clock is just not quite right. But biblical joy is a fundamental characteristic of the Christian life. And that subject fills the pages of our Bible. It was surprising to me when I began to research this topic, how often it is spoken of. Religion is often perceived as rather morbid, kind of dull, kind of subdued, uninteresting. And yet that is not the way the Bible describes the true faith. So this is going to be a topical sermon today. Biblical joy is a fundamental characteristic of the Christian life. And so we're going to look at this theme of biblical joy. And the title of the sermon is Rejoice in the Lord Always. Rejoice in the Lord always. I've given a number of sermons on themes over the years, and one of the best methods for preparing a sermon on a topic like this is to use multi-volume Bible encyclopedias and dictionaries, and also the common dictionary. And I'm going to use five of them here today because what they do is assemble for you the original words give you a brief definition, and then they give you examples of these words used throughout Scripture. I'm going to begin in English, that is our native language. Just going to your average English dictionary can add so much. Sometimes it's fun just to read from cover to cover. Anybody ever do that? Nobody. Well, if you're just bored some night, try it. So it's amazing how much you will learn. Even just flipping around and reading the definitions, you will expand your vocabulary. 
One of my favorite English dictionaries for a word study is Webster's unabridged edition of 1913. Now this edition is still available online in multiple places and in free Bible software. I've downloaded it to my free software called eSword. It's my favorite Bible software and it's all free. You can buy individual modules, but the basics are free. And this is a freebie. Webster's Unabridged Dictionary not only goes through every definition compiled by Noah Webster and others through the years, that edition of 1913 gives you Bible examples. Examples from scripture where that word is used with that sense. And he quotes from famous English literature like Shakespeare to give you illustrations of how that particular definition is used. So I looked up the word joy. Here's what he explains. Number one definition. It is the passion or emotion excited by the acquisition or expectation of good. It is pleasurable feelings or emotions caused by success, good fortune, and the like, or by a rational prospect of possessing what we love or desire. Gladness, exhilaration of spirits, and delight. And Webster gives examples from Dryden and Johnson. But I want to take you to one that he gives as a biblical example of this first definition. And it was a surprise to me years ago when I discovered this, because I've given a topic like this after the feast numerous times over the years in my congregations. Let's go to Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Hebrews 12 and verse 1. We're going to see right off the bat something different about Christian joy. Hebrews 12, verse 1. And therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. He's using an analogy of a runner <coughs> in, a, in a race. <coughs> Excuse me. And he has to lay aside his normal attire. And the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He encourages us to run the Christian race with the imagination of Christ at the goal line, who is there like a loving father or mother cheering you on to give it that last ounce of energy. Who for the, catch this, the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And that struck me when I first came across this in this theme, that Jesus endured the cross, despised the shame for the joy that was set before him. That joy was a sense that he had a mission to accomplish and that he was going to succeed at it, even as painful and as miserable as it was. And so even in the midst of the most horrible circumstances, God's people can have joy. Why? Because we know who we are and we know where we're going. We know what God is going to accomplish in us. And so in that definition was the word success and prospect of possessing what we love or desire. And it's a good definition to describe Jesus' joy here in Hebrews. Second definition it gives is that which causes joy or happiness. And again quotes a Bible verse from Paul. For you are our glory and joy. That's Paul speaking of his beloved brethren. What joy they gave him. And he says, you are our glory and our joy. And then they also quote Keats. And then the third definition, a sign or exhibition of joy, gaiety, mirth, merriment, festivity. Festivity, like we just had at the Feast of Tabernacles. Various synonyms are offered in this Webster's. Gladness, pleasure, delight, happiness, exultation, transport, 
felicity, ecstasy, rapture, bliss, gaiety, mirth, merriment, festivity, hilarity. Some of the words have fallen out of use in time, and yet they're very interesting related words. Now, as an intransitive verb, there's also to joy. Let's go to Habakkuk. Now, you may have a little trouble locating this book, but I can guarantee you it's in the Bible, and it's in the Minor Prophets. We don't go to Habakkuk very often. It's before the book of Zephaniah, after the book of Nahum. Habakkuk chapter 3. We're going to read a hymn of faith. From Habakkuk. And here it's used as the word joy is used as an intransitive verb. Hebrews 3, verse 17. Though the fig tree may not blossom. He's describing a time of devastation at the end. Nor fruit be on the vines. Though the labor of the olive may fail. And the fields yield no food. Though the flock may be cut off from the fold. And though there be no herd in the stalls. Even with all of that against him in his environment, in his world. Yet I will joy or rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. I hope all of us feel that way. That Christianity is a joy. It's not always easy. Christ never promised it was going to be easy. He never said, become a Christian and all your problems will be solved. Did he? If that were the case, Christianity be, would have many more adherents, I'm sure. But in fact, when we become Christians, often things become more difficult. And this is not God's world presently. It's his creation, but it's not his society. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high hills. It's a lovely passage. We need to read more often. And then there's another verb to joy, and that is to joy the friend, to joy a friend, to actually gladden, to give joy, to make joyful, to exhilarate someone. So that's the English definition. Now let me turn to some definitions from Hebrew and Greek. Now, I won't go into all the particular details, just to give you a summary. But the idea of joy, this comes from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. The idea of joy is expressed in the Old Testament by a wealth of synonymous words that cannot easily be differentiated. They're very close to each other, and there's multiple words. The commonest is simcha, variously translated in English versions by the Bible, words joy, gladness, mirth, from samea, properly, to be bright, to shine. You know, when someone's especially happy, their faces shine. One of the uh, flight attendants on our flight back from San Diego yesterday was especially joyful. Red hair, and she served us where we were seated, providing us everything to picking up our garbage. And every time that she served us, she said, thank you to us. And I was just impressed by her happiness that she got so much pleasure out of serving us. Other Hebrew words are masos, sason, from sus, properly to spring, to leap. We think about young animals just born as they begin to exult, to rejoice, to shout and jump about. Go around the circle. Even that's part of the idea, to be excited. Sometimes when you come home from a long trip and you, your dog sees you for the first time, they'll do that. They'll run around circles and jump all over you, happy, animal joy. So that's the Old Testament. In our New Testament, the commonest words are kara, joy, kairo, to rejoice, charis, from the, related to the word charis, for grace. So joy is an aspect of God's grace. We also have agaliasis, which expresses exuberant joy, to rejoice exceedingly, to exult. So those are the biblical words, and that's all we will spend time on that. But you can find these for yourself. Look up these words. I think you'll find them very helpful. I'm going to turn now to my third source, and that's the Strong and McClintock Encyclopedia article on joy. 
these authors put together three different types of joy in the human life. One is natural joy, and they're bringing all the synonyms and how they are just shades and nuances a little bit different from the word joy. Natural joy is of various degrees. When it's moderate, it's called gladness. When raised on a sudden to a highest degree, it is exaltation or transport. When we limit our desires by our possessions, it is contentment. When our desires are raised high and yet accomplished, this is called satisfaction. When our joy is derived from some comical occasion or amusement, it is mirth. If it arise from considerable opposition that is vanquished in the pursuit of the good we desire, it is then called triumph. When joy has so long possessed a mind that it settled into a temper, we call it cheerfulness. And when we rejoice upon the account of any good that others ob obtain, it may be called sympathy or congratulation. Wonderful nuances that all derive from the broad concept of joy. So that's natural joy. Now let's go into moral joy. Moral joy is of several kinds, as the self-approbation or that which arises from the performance of any good actions. This is called peace or serenity of conscience. If the action be honorable and the joy rises high, it may be called glory. And now the last one that may be the most interest in our biblical mindset, spiritual joy. There's also a spiritual joy which the scripture calls a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. In this section, the Apostle Paul differentiates the works of the flesh versus the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 and verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. But notice, joy comes right up there. Number two, love, joy, peace. This is to be part of the Christian character and behavior. Fruit of the Spirit. Now let's go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Another prison epistle of Paul when he, he wrote, sitting in jail, sitting in a home arrest, house arrest, there in Rome, which the way the book of Acts concludes. And yet Paul was able to talk about this in Philippians 1, starting in verse 23. Philippians 1, 23. Paul says, I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Paul was contemplating death. He did not know how this would turn out. It was actually his second imprisonment in Rome, as far as we can tell, in which Paul was executed. But even in his first, he wondered at times, what was ahead for him? And he begins to think about eternal life. He begins to weigh life. Should I hang on to life in the present, or should I look only to the life in the, to come? And that's why he says, I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ in the kingdom of God, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. He's thinking about his beloved brethren there at Philippi, knowing that he was their pastor, he had a responsibility, therefore he needed to remain in order to help them. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue all for your progress and joy of faith. Did you catch that? That your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by coming to you again. There's a joy that's special between ministry and brethren. The ministers can describe that for you. And brethren can describe that from their perspective. There's a special relationship that is built over years that eventually includes trust and confidence in each other. Because you've known each other so well, you've worked together so well, 
and you've struggled together in a certain congregation, whatever it may be facing at the time. And so this congregation had been very generous to Paul when he was in prison, had sent him supplies. And so the word joy and exaltation is used through the, throughout this epistle. It's a joyous epistle by contrast to, let's say, First and Second Corinthians. Uh, Paul had trouble with those problem children over there in Corinth. But in Philippi, it was a very different story. And so he says at the end of verse 25, for your progress and joy of faith, Paul is going to remain on to serve them. And that in turn, their rejoicing for me may be more abundant. In which they would see that he was going to continue to serve them. More abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3, starting in verse 4. We believe this is one of Paul's epistles as well, completing the 14-volume set. Hebrews 13, sorry, Hebrews 3, starting in verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. The hope that God's people have gives them a prevailing joy, a cause for rejoicing. And every time we gather, true every Sabbath, every holy day, Every feast day we gather, it is a rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So this is spiritual joy. What are things or people would we otherwise joy in? Let's go to Isaiah 61. Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61, starting in verse 10. Isaiah 61.10. Isaiah writes, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. Of course, this is the one we now call Jesus Christ. He was this God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, L-O-R-D, small caps. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation, covered me with the robes of of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Isn't that a lovely picture? You know, some people really fuss about clothing, they want to look right, look proper, and we should be concerned to an extent, naturally, especially when we come before God. And so in the scripture, this is how we are pictured as coming into God's kingdom, receiving new garments, garments of salvation. We can take off these old clothes of this life and put on these garments of salvation, robes of righteousness. Now, I don't know how you feel about wearing robes, but this is how the Bible describes. This was the common attire for people in that world, and much of the world even yet today. And then it goes on to describe him like a, a bridegroom, decks himself with ornaments, a bride with her jewels. A lovely picture about righteousness and praise and rejoicing in the Lord in verse 10. Let's go to 1 Peter 1, verse 6. 1 Peter 1, verse 6. 1 Peter 1, verse 6. Now the Apostle Peter's turn to give us some instruction. <clears throat> Peter says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, <clears throat> excuse me, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. You've been distressed, 
Peter writes his first epistle to beloved brethren experiencing persecution from various sources, including from the state. They're coming down hard on God's people. And he says that you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. How I love that passage. Joy inexpressible and full of glory. In other words, brethren, this cannot be expressed to unbelievers. They do not know what we're talking about, nor have they ever experienced it. This is a special relationship that God's people have with Christ that gets them through tough times. Oh, I know when we come back from the feast, we have a number of serious things looming in the horizon, it seems. Our problems that we left when we went to the feast are there to welcome us with open arms as soon as we come back. And there they are. And maybe more you didn't plan on having until you got back. But God's people have a joy inexpressible that that cannot subside. Those things cannot take this from them. And so he says, we have a joy inexpressible. In other words, we cannot explain this to an unbeliever. We can maybe explain it to each other. It's a special joy. But to an unbeliever, they just won't get it because there's a missing dimension. It's called the Holy Spirit and the fellowship of the faith. And full of glory, he says, receiving the end of our faith, the salvation of our soul. This is the end. This is the tell us to which we are heading, the salvation of our souls. And so Christ himself is our joy. Let's go to Psalm 119. If we were to count the Psalms as chapters, the longest of the Bible, but the Psalms are separate works, not chapters in the usual sense. But Psalm 119, let's start in verse 161. Psalm 119, verse 161. The psalmist writes, remember these are the lyrics of Israel's hymns in the temple. Princes persecute me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. Do you treasure that Bible, brethren? God's people have not had available to them the resources that you and I have available today. Even in the first century church, it was unlikely that they had many of the books of the Hebrew Bible because they were cumbersome scrolls that were guarded in the synagogues. And when the Christians were expelled from the synagogues, they did not take those scrolls with them. People had to memorize the Bible. And if there were any scrolls, any writings like of the apostles, then the brethren heard it on the Sabbath. They didn't have Bibles in their laps to take home and study again. Not for centuries did the common man have a Bible affordable to take home until fairly modern times. And now with our computer resources, we have access to every available resource on the internet to study God's word. And how diligent are we in doing that? I hope we are devoting our attention to it as we should. And rejoicing in God's word, as it says in verse 162, is one who finds great treasure. People are pursuing all kinds of goals and dreams. And our newspapers and media are filled with these celebrities and what they're seeking and people are so curious and we've got to know the latest on so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and, -so and their relationship. God's people do not find pleasure in those things. They find pleasure in the Word of God which teaches us how to live, how to serve God, how to enter the kingdom of God. Let's go to Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2.
Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our sins put us in a warring state with our God. Our loving Father, no doubt, was hurt when we turned away from Him, as He no doubt was with Adam and Eve and all the generations ever since, breaking His heart. But He could not compromise with His standard. He could not compromise with His law. We were at war because of what we had done with our God. We were the ones who left Him, yet He was there. Even as he walked in the garden, Adam and Eve are hiding because of their sin. Typical of how this happens. And yet, now we have peace with our God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom, verse 2, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which you stand and rejoice in hope and the glory of God. Whenever I hear that word or read that word, stand in the Bible, it reminds me of a sentinel or a soldier on duty or going into combat who doesn't run but stands strong. And so through faith, through whom also we have access by faith to this grace in whom we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This is the happiness of the future state, the nature and properties of this joy. We are now right with our God. And then he gives us this blessing every year to go off and celebrate eight days of pure joy, depicting the kingdom of God, second resurrection, and the ages beyond, the heavens of the heavens, new heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem, eternity. So much to look forward to. Philippians 4, verse 4. And so what is important now is now that we brought home this joy, to not let it be dimmed. Philippians 4 and verse 4. About six months' time, we'll have another boost with the spring feast. But in the meantime, we have much service to do, much, many things to accomplish for God. And so, Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, Again, I say, rejoice. The other day, my wife was writing some greeting cards to send off to brethren who couldn't make it to the feast. And she said, what Bible verse comes to mind that I could cite for them? And this is the verse that popped in my mind. And this is the title of our sermon today. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And this is the one I recited for. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, Rejoice, always, always, even through those tough times, unknown to the people of the world. It's inexpressible to them. And yet for God's people, it's to be permanent. Now I turn to another resource called the New Dictionary of Christian Ethics and Pastoral Theology. And it goes through joy saying, few qualities of life are more universally desired and more widely misunderstood than joy. Typically, it is viewed as an, as a, an emotional condition. Typically, let me start over. Typically, it is viewed as a fruit of one's circumstances and as an emotional condition. Biblically, joy has three distinctive characteristics which radically distinguish it from its circumstantial and emotional counterpart. So here are these three Distinctive characteristics. Number one, rather than being dependent upon circumstances, Christian joy is a fruit of the Spirit, as we saw, and a condition of one's being. It is part of us, an essential part of us. Romans 14. Romans 14, verses 16 and 17. Romans 14, verses 16 and 17. Paul writes, therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now we have been sated at the feast and satiated 
at the feast with all the variety of food items that we have enjoyed. In our family, we sampled various food types of European and otherwise around the world. We have been well fed. But I want you to notice what Paul says. That's not what the Feast of Tabernacles is all about. To the unbeliever or to people that might go along with members of God's church who are not members, it might be the highlights of the feast. But for God's people, it's something else. The kingdom of God, which we were celebrating and honoring in those eight days, is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. These are spiritual verities that God's people believe in and live every day. Righteousness, right behavior, right relationship with God, peace with God through Jesus Christ, and now joy in the Holy Spirit. You catch that? That joy comes from the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. So, number one, it is a fruit of the Spirit in the condition of our being. Let's go to John 16 and verse 20. John 16, starting in verse 20. Jesus is preparing his disciples for carrying on in his absence. In the book of John, he has been telling them about his coming resurrection, and they do not know what to make of it. Because the Jewish world in the centuries prior to Jesus' coming, they called the intertestamental period, had many different views about resurrection, no resurrection, immortal soul, heaven, hell, all this was beginning to infiltrate Judaism from Greek philosophy. And Jesus, knowing that he was going to go back to heaven and authorize his disciples to carry on the work, has to prepare them for what's ahead. So here in John 16, verse 20, Most assuredly I say to you, you will weep and lament, and the world will, re will rejoice. When times are tough and God's people weep, the loss of a beloved leader, a family member, a tragedy of some kind. The world goes right on rejoicing, having its parties. This is what they like to have. They'll rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. And then he compares it to something that's very common part of life, a woman giving birth. So all of you mothers out there, you can identify with this. A woman, when she's in labor, has sorrow. And I was present with the birth of all four of our children. I saw my wife's labor pangs. She has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. All that pain now subsides and the joy takes over as a mother is able to nurse that child for the first time and then later as able family members come to congratulate her. It's a joyous time, unlike anything else in life. Verse 22, therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again. You see, Jesus is leaving and they're sorrowful. And they don't understand it. But he says, I will see you again. This is the essential doctrine of the second coming. I will see you again and your heart will rejoice. And your joy no one will take from you. No one. No one. No one can take that joy from you. Except perhaps maybe, brethren, you. If you were to give up on God. But he won't give up on you. You see, this is this joy that is unique in the world. And so it's a fruit of the Spirit in the condition of our lives. Number two, because of the independence of Christian joy from circumstances, Christians are commanded to rejoice in all things. Let's go to John 14. 
just over a couple pages. John 14, starting verse 27, 28. John 14, 27 and 28. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I like to read this when I conduct Passover. We read excerpts from these chapters in John, and I like to emphasize that verse in the Passover service. Peace. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, we have peace with him. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give you. Don't let your heart be troubled or afraid. You have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. He says, you should rejoice that I'm going back to rejoin my Father. We all liked and enjoy being reunited with family, father, mother, children, grandchildren. He says, if you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father, even though they did not want him to leave didn't understand the timetable of his second coming. He says, you should rejoice, for my Father is greater than I. But here is a joy, you, the, joy rejoicing even for others, even the loss of a beloved friend close at hand or relative. Even despite circumstances, Christians can have that kind of joy. James chapter 1. James 1, verse 2. And James as well writes to his beloved brethren going through difficult times. This entire chapter is about how to deal with trials. James chapter 1, starting in verse 2. My brethren. When you read the book of James, notice how often he refers to brethren. It's one of the most common words. When I have this cover this book in class, I show my students a word cloud in which all the prominent words, they're all jumbled together, but their most prominent words are bigger and different colors than others. And they, this is one of the most prominent words in this word cloud. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, do you find that easy? <laughs> I don't. I don't think any of us find it easy. And yet James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing, this is the answer, that the testing of your faith produces patience or patient endurance or perseverance. We have to be patient to enter God's kingdom. Life goes through struggles. These struggles have a meaning. They have a purpose. So let patience have its perfect work. It's a work that God is pursuing in us, in our lives, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, in verse 4. So it does not depend on circumstances. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 4. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 4. Paul writes, 2 Corinthians 7, 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. And Paul, of any of us, suffered. When you read that account, that long list of all that he endured on his many travels to serve God. Yet he counts them all joy, he says. Why? I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation because he knew the end of the story. He knew there was a final chapter. He knew this had a purpose that was leading into something. We're going to be helping people on into the millennium whose lives are shattered, who have gone through the most serious troubles, personal troubles they could ever imagine. 
and they're going to need help. And some of the troubles that we go through are preparing us for that. That we will have empathy and sympathy with those people to better serve them, to help them along, to succeed, to come to know God. Let's go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 3. Romans 5, starting in verse 3. Paul writes to the church at Rome, though he had not yet been there. There's a congregation there. He writes to them from afar. And he writes, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character. That's a word our church has emphasized a lot over the years. We're building Christian character. These fine qualities that are priceless, that are essential element of the whole Christian nature. It builds character and character builds hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit given to us. And so Paul was able to glory in tribulations knowing it was producing something for eternity. We can't always understand how these circumstances lead up to something valuable. But we do know the God who does know, and that's what makes the difference. God knows what he's doing. He knows what he's accomplishing. And number three, this article on joy from this particular volume, the Christian joy does not isolate the jubilant from those who weep and mourn. It holds a place for tears and enables compassionate participation in others' pain. Joy is not completely pushed aside even through tears as we share those ups and downs with people. Revelation chapter 21. And this is an image that God's people have had in mind as they have faced that final chapter. Through the centuries, Revelation chapter 21. I love to read this section when I give a last great day sermon because it tells us all about the great beyond, even well beyond the millennium, the resurrections on into eternity. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, also there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down, verse 2, out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, with all those beautiful garments that we described earlier, and jewelry, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. That was the purpose of the tabernacle. God wanted to dwell with his people. It's his dwelling place. And now he will have it forever with the redeemed. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be more, any more pain, for the former things have passed away. It will truly be a new age. <clears throat> I'm going to go to Hastings' one-volume dictionary now and take a, a few more uh, scriptures quoted in that particular volume. It's a one-volume Hastings Dictionary. He also did a multi-volume, but I like the one volume as well, and this article was especially interesting. Let's go to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 22. Luke 15, starting in verse 22. This is the famous story of the so-called prodigal son or the lost son, or the son who returned, or the unhappy brother, or the loving father. <laughs> Various titles have been offered to this story. Luke 15, verse 22. This is when the father gets word that his son who had betrayed him, take, took his inheritance and wasted it, was on his way back. <clears throat> but the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe, put it on him, Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. In other words, he was improperly dressed, starving, nothing to signify he came from a family of wealth at all. 
I have never seen so many homeless people as we saw in San Diego. And we asked, why was that? We asked the locals. They said, because of the weather, because of the good weather year round. They were everywhere, just dwelling under bushes. If they, some had tents, some pushing shopping carts, bags full of stuff, and they were dirty and grubby and sunburned. It's a disgrace to our nation that we're allowing such a thing to happen, but there it is. So the father sees his son return looking like a homeless person. And he says, bring out the best robe. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his hand. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Can you imagine? And this is an example that this dictionary gives of festive joy like we enjoyed for those eight days. Festive joy. We had much to celebrate. We come out of a world that is much against God's people, much against the truth, and we're surrounded by people that we have so much in common with. Even though we may never have met, we have a common bond that God, the people of the world do not have. This is a festive or social joy that is part of joy as well. Then we have in the Old Testament, Beatitudes. Blessed is the man, or how happy. And then we have some of those in our New Testament. In fact, the last book of our Bible has a set that many do not realize are there. Maybe someday I'll give you a sermon on it. It's a wonderful study by itself. The Beatitudes of that last book. But here we have religious happiness, a peace. And a substratum, of course, or a peace being a substratum of joy. And here's what they, well, before we get to that, let me turn to John 15. John 15, verse 10. John 15, 10. John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy may be full. See, contrary to the view of Jesus, is very sober and morbid, he was filled with joy. And that's the joy he wants to share with his people. And when Passover comes, we read excerpts of these chapters. And again, I like to read that verse among them. Because Passover is a heavy time for God's people. As we reflect on the many failings over the past year, we're thinking of our baptismal commitment to God. We're renewing our service to God, that service. But we need to walk from that service clean and refreshed and renewed. And to read verses like this does the trick, I found, as we say, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. So here's what this Bible dictionary says, quote, joy is more conspicuous in Christianity than in any other religion and in the Bible than any other literature, especially the true Christian religion. Psychologically, joy is the index of health, spiritual health, index of health, we could say, affecting the uh, vigorous and harmonious exercise of its powers. I like that definition, explanation. The Old Testament joy of God breaks out again in the canticles of our New Testament. And what drives these hymns of praise, words of praise and glory in the early chapters of the Old Testament are the words of the hope of Israel, knowing that it was leading to something that was a fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. The hope of Israel. 
So let's go to John 17, 13. John 17, 13 says, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. This is part of Jesus' intercessory prayer. He acts as our high priest. And this is a private prayer. John 17 is only the words of Christ that he speaks to his Father before his death. And this is what he says about us. But now I come to you, Father, these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. So Christian joy is finding your treasure, life's treasures. Matthew 13, one of the parables describes this. And I've given sermons at the feast about the parables of the kingdom. And this is one of them, Matthew 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. Remember that parable? Luke 13, 13 sorry not Luke Matthew Matthew 13 44 again the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field this is the Christian's treasure hidden in the field now we're willing to pay the ultimate price to pay all to gain and that's an attitude that we assured God of at our baptism. That's something we have to live out every day. It's not easy to live it always, but that's what we promised God, wasn't it? In our covenant. Let's go to Acts chapter 16 and verse 34. Acts 16, verse 34. This is a story of the conversion of the Philippian jailer. The jailer had to keep Paul after he'd been beaten up in Philippi. And Paul and Silas were singing hymns. And it was so moving to this man, he wanted to know more about what drove these men that they could sing hymns after being so ill-treated. And Paul and Silas instruct him as to what he needed to do to come to serve God. He goes through baptism, he and his family, after they had sufficient understanding. And so in Acts 16, 34, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. He had even more to rejoice over than that his family as well came with him into God's church. And those of you who have your family with you, it's an extra blessing, extra blessing. He believed in God with all of his household. What a special treat that was for him. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Dr. Luke wrote this book as well, one of the Gospels. Luke chapter 1. In fact, Luke wrote a very large share of our New Testament between his two large books. Luke chapter 1, verse 13. This is the story of the word that's coming to the parents of John the Baptist, Zechariah and Elizabeth. They had been barren. They had served God all their lives. They were blameless in the law. But now the angel says to 
Zacharias, first, Luke chapter 1, 13, the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will call his name John. Now, in that day, you did not know what the sex of the baby would be. Today, it's very common for young parents to know well in advance. I still like it the old-fashioned way. In fact, when my own children started having children, some chose to know ahead, some didn't. But I told them, don't tell me. And they had to keep that secret for nine months. <laughs> and once in a while, it would slip. Certain hints were given. But most times, they did a pretty good job. To me, it's very special to, to learn the sex of that baby at birth. But he's told he's going to have a son. But he says, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son. You'll call him John, even though it wasn't a family name, as far as we can tell. But you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Because, you see, they're being given, as this chapter goes on, an understanding that this is the boy who is going to set the stage, prepare the way for the first coming of the Savior that would preach the kingdom of God is at hand. John did, and then Jesus did, and then the apostles did. The kingdom of God was this common theme all through the Gospels. The kingdom of God. And this couple, elderly, barren to that point now, they've been chosen to give birth to the predecessor of this Savior. Joy and gladness shall fill your hearts, and many will rejoice at his birth. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, in verse 46. Acts chapter 2, in verse 46. This is the occasion when Peter has given this moving Pentecost sermon. 3,000 people respond. Can you imagine? Finding enough water to baptize them all and enough dunkers <laughs> to immerse them all in water. Acts 2, 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. This was common Christian fellowship meal. They ate their food with gladness, simplicity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Right from the start, joy permeates Christianity. So I like what these authors said, that Christianity has a sense of joy unlike any other religion, if you just classify them as religions, which scholars do. Let's go to Jude 24. Jude 24. Jude 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. And when I give my Bible study, yes, Mr. Smith, I am scheduled for that Bible study. I will be concluding with this passage. And we'll see it in the context because it has a very deep meaning. But you don't get it until you read the whole book. And we will on that one occasion. So stay tuned. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you faultless, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To him, and this doxology is what it's called, he says, you will be, stand before God at that day, faultless, in his presence, with exceeding joy. That's a great reassurance. Because I know our consciences trouble us deeply at times. They beat us up at times. But in the end, that's how it's going to be. 
That's how Jude describes it. A wonderful occasion. One more reference, Matthew 5, verses 11 and 12. Matthew 5, verses 11 and 12. In the Beatitudes, Jesus lists for us in two different books of our Gospels the essential attitudes of Christianity. These are the fundamental characteristics of people who live into the kingdom of God. Verse 11, blessed are you when, you, when they revile, revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Don't let it bother you. Put it aside. Don't let it drag you down. He says instead, verse 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You're in good company. Many, many, many of God's people, including prophets and apostles, have suffered, had miserable times serving God. And yet they found that biblical joy that drove them on to finish the job until the end. And so, brethren, it can drive us on to finish the job to the end no matter what we may face yet ahead of us. Biblical joy is something that we can always experience. It's to be a permanent characteristic of our lives. Not just when things go well, but at all times, becoming a regular feature of Christian living. So review these scriptures, I hope, through the rest of the year, especially when life gets difficult. And just refresh your memory. Refresh those feast memories that you've brought home that you're going to share today. Let us preserve this festive spirit as we venture forth through the rest of the sacred year.